think something that breaks my heart a lot is when Christianity is almost used as as the religion of in some you know the rich or as you know the the western countries are the christian countries and they don't know what's happening across the world and you just said the words that christ came for the marginalized mm. he came as poor for the poor mm. you know he, he he was tried as a criminal for criminals he mm. was you know in all things mm. he took the the least possible image he could mm. so it breaks my heart almost to see Christianity be labeled as that when it's completely the opposite, that that's what Christ is and was and, yeah. and still is today. But, but that's what, what Philippians 2 is all about, right? That mm. Christ emptied himself from all this glory and he was clothed with humility, right? Rode on the donkey instead of the cherubim, right? He died the worst type of death and he endured it even to the death of the cross for our sake. This is Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, it is a must for us to do it. So that takes me actually to the next question for both of you. It's a tough one, sorry, and I'm probably coming out of nowhere, but there is no social justice without Christ. Mm. And there is no Christ without social justice. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain that to everyone so that they can understand more of that mystery? Go sorry, for it. it's a tough go one. For it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we have to make a, a, a big distinction between humanitarian work and Christian work, meaning true social justice will always have Christ and the Creator at its foundation. And it's a work that is full of the presence of God. So it's not only about like necessarily feeding the poor. Yeah, I'm feeding the poor, you know, bread and giving them water, but I'm also feeding them spiritually. There is the presence of Christ that is there that is doing this work. So it's not just a humanitarian type of work that is done outside of Christ because there are other things that come along with that, which what, like you, you mentioned earlier in the first question, what is social justice? Because today's terminology or definition of social justice has taken on a different direction altogether. Mm -hmm. There are many things that we attach or we couple with social justice today that are not really social justice. It's not how Christ would do it. So as Christians, we have to come back always to God and wonder, well, should I listen or believe or do just as I'm being told by the world? Or there are certain things that don't follow certain Christian standards. Um, and if I am Christian, if this is who I am, if this is my identity, that then this guides and pushes everything that I do in this world. So to do proper social justice, it has to be done in Christ. He has to be the foundation. We have to follow his commandments. We do not renegotiate uh, what humanity is, but we follow again in his footsteps. Yeah. How can you have love without love himself, right? Absolutely. If he is love, how can we love our brother and sister without him? Yeah. But Nermina, I'll ask you the opposite side of that now. Christianity without the poor or Christianity without social justice is impossible, right? Well, you Here's a, a remarkable statement. I cannot find salvation without my brother. Mm -hmm. So why would I say something like that? Um, the, the young man, the, the lawyer who came to Christ, and he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Christ asked him, says, what's your reading of it? And he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your strength and your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Christ said, yep, that's it. That's it. Go for it. Go ahead and do that. And then the lawyer goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the story of the, the Good Samaritan. And so Christ at the end, he asks him, so who was then neighbor to, to the man? Uh, and the young man said, the one who had compassion on him. Mm -hmm. And he says, yes, go and do likewise. So why did he? Uh, mention and love the neighbor as yourself. You know, in other words, Christ could have uh, could have said, "No, no, that's it. You know, love your God, and that's it." But no, he insisted. 
you know, it, you know, the the man mentioned uh, the neighbor, and Christ said, "Yes, that's that's correct." Yes, but who's my neighbor? He explained to him, "This is my neighbor." So what Christ is saying, mm. without having compassion on your neighbor, will you inherit eternal life? Mm. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. So is my neighbor in this case only the Christians? It's whomever God mm -hmm. puts in your path. Excellent, because like the Samaritan and the Jews are not friends here, right? Absolutely. So, so as a Christian, as a Coptic Christian, whatever background I have, my neighbor means the Christian, the Muslim, the atheist, the Jew. Like all of us are one humanity. All of us are in the image of God, and my responsibility extends beyond Christianity, right? And that actually um, um, is very important for us as, as Christians as well, that, you know, living, you know, at least Coptic Christians and those living in Egypt, um, you know, we, we are able to, you know, thankfully and by, by God's grace to be able to extend the Christ's love to others as well, regardless of their background and religion. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, it's not theoretical. No. It's not. Who, who's my neighbor? You know, it's uh, it's very concrete. Whoever God puts in your path, yeah. that's who you must love. Mm. That's who you must help. That's that's your neighbor, and it's because of him that you could then inherit eternal life. Okay, so you didn't wake up one morning and think to yourself, thirty six years ago, eighty six thousand children, here I come. I'm going to help you, right? For those of us who wake up in the morning and we're like, okay, I want to find my neighbor. I want to I wanna do this for Christ. What's that first step? And I'm going to ask you the follow-up, the second hardest step. But the first step I find is the hardest. I know you disagree because before we started here, you said, no, there's a harder step. But you're going to tell everyone about <laughs> after. But that first step yes. where laziness, we're always, you know, tomorrow will come. Tomorrow will come. What is it? Your first step is to take action. Do something. You can give, give of your time, give of your money, give of your energy. Um, uh, Mother Teresa has a lovely saying that she says, you have to give until it hurts, just as Christ gave until mm. it hurt. And so when you're writing that check to the church or to Coptic orphans, and it doesn't hurt, just add a zero. What's another thing you could do? You could sponsor an orphan in Egypt through mm -hmm. Coptic orphans. You can go and serve uh, through our Surf to Learn program where you could teach children uh, English mm -hmm. there in the south of Egypt. Do something. Yeah. Just as Christ went about doing good. And this is an exercise that I often do with the children and their mothers and in they are in Egypt. Is I say, decide on doing uh, tell me something good that you will do. Mm -hmm. And it becomes really hard because they go, Well, if someone needs help, no, 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 no. Don't start it with if. Mm. Start it with I will and then and then continue. Um and it becomes really hard to make a decision to do good. And, it, and after much conversation, they finally get to the part where, okay, I will make pastries for my neighbor. I will go cook for the sick lady that lives down the street. I, the two young girls said that they will go and they will mop the floor for the church to make it sparkle and clean. Yeah. And, and so it's a decision to do good and it's not hard to start just start we tend to overthink sometimes right yes i actually remember the story talking about like you know just simple actions um again it was a story like of a meeting in egypt uh, it was a youth meeting uh, the, the youth weren't going and whatnot and all of a sudden the, like the meeting was booming mm. people didn't understand why it was booming like nothing changed about the meeting to make it boom right but in reality, there was some guy in the background that used to know Egypt is very dusty. So when he would come and, 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 du and clean the dust off the chairs, he would pray oh. and say, God, reveal yourself to the person that will sit on this chair. Oh. God, open the heart. of So simple. 
And when the person would sit, you know, the Holy Spirit would work, and next thing you know, the meeting was booming. And such a small action. Also, I learned from one of the youth in church, funny enough, you know, because we, we speak a lot about spiritual canons, do your prayers, do your Bible, all of these things. Um, one of you said, you know, we should have as part of our spiritual canon, like to do one good action on a daily basis. You know, to a stranger, like whether it's a homeless person, someone in need, of whatever. Like, but it's a duty that I have on a daily basis. And I think the good thing about this is that it develops a habit in you, and bit by bit it becomes a part of you, right? And it can grow. So, uh, we tend to overplan, mm -hmm. <laughs> to overthink, mm -hmm. keep it simple, and God will do the rest. You know? So, when I told you the hardest step is to start, you corrected me right away, and you said, "No, that's not the hardest step." What is the hardest step? To keep going. <laughs> okay, so great. Resilience. Now I'm going to ask you the question. How? <laughs> How? Through God's grace, through determination, um, be resilient when it comes to doing good. We often are extremely resilient in our careers or in our academic uh, work, uh, but we need to also have that same determination, that same zeal when it comes to doing good. And, and especially for those where they see injustice and it burns their heart mm -hmm. to see such injustice, you cannot leave that. And so with a lot of prayers mm -hmm. and a lot of complaining to God. So tell me about that, the prayer, like what your, your actual, you know, experience with prayer, have you found that this is like, you can't have one without the other? Um. Your prayers are more like, God, did you see what just happened? Are you <laughs> aware of this is going on? How could you do that? And why? Because when you're doing this, don't complain to anyone yeah, outside. Social but media. No, yeah. yes, no, complain no social God, media. Yeah. Complain to God all you want. Um, pull, Yanni, throw out all your frustrations to God. Um, ask for wisdom. That's really important. Ask for wisdom. Ask for guidance. Ask for strength. And God will then be give, give you those, um, the joy of the small accomplishments, the little things here and there. And then you can't help but begin to thank him for, for such graciousness and for the honor of allowing you to work alongside him. I think mm -hmm. it's the greatest honor that yeah. you could ever have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you you keep thanking him for how gracious he is mm -hmm. and how kind he is.